All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Um, I'm MC Owens, as usual. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, as usual. Um, and tonight, for tonight's uh, Dharma talk, for our discussion, uh, tonight's theme or the topic is the lotus flower. In particular, we're going to talk about the blue lotus, and we're going to talk kind of all night uh, about the significance of the blue lotus flower. We are going to talk about sort of the significance of the lotus flower, the blue lotus flower, and all of this, all of these ideas tonight are being inspired by the sutra that we've been reading, the Upaya Sutra. Um, we are going to reach a point where they're going to be talking about the Blue Lotus. And that's what sort of inspired me to, oh, to sort of like weave together a talk tonight that's going to all be based around the theme of the Lotus Flower. I suppose what I'm, what I want to say, what I want to be clear about is that in our sutra, we are going, there is a reference to the blue lotus, but there's a reference to it actually as a medicine. And so there's a subtopic tonight, which is going to be Buddhist medicine. So that's a subtopic of everything. But what I'm saying is though, is that although the sutra is talking about the lotus flower, the blue lotus as a form of medicine, I'm going to use that as sort of a, again, a, a theme to riff on tonight, where we're going to talk about all kinds of things, uh, lotus flower in that way. Um, so actually, before I even get to the sutra and the kind of the actual passage I want to read, let's go ahead and start by just talking about the lotus flower in general. I think this is actually a really interesting topic it's an interesting thing to discuss because it's actually very central to buddhism like the flower as a symbol but then specifically the lotus flower as a symbol and of course i'm sure you're aware that if you notice images of buddhas and bodhisattvas they are always often seated on lotus flowers and there's a that deep connection with buddhism and the lotus flower so i always like to kind of begin <laughs> at the beginning so to speak and what i mean is is that i want to start with sort of the early references to the lotus flower and this is an important kind of thing to reference because <laughs> I've given a Dharma talk, I don't know when it was, long time ago, where I talked about the lotus flower as a, uh, as a simile, as a metaphor, and I even kind of spoke about the origins of the lotus flower, and then I forgot, like, I give so many Dharma talks, I forgot where the, what sutra did I read, I almost tried to go back and find the video, but I eventually remembered and I found the original sutra. So I want to start there and I want to kind of really document this particular thing. So it actually took me a while to find this the first time and it took me a while to find it uh, yesterday. And what it is, is that we're going to be reading or I'm going to be reading um, to start I'm going to be reading a couple of passages from this collection of suttas. This is the early Buddhist canon, the Pali canon, right? All the sutras or the suttas that are in Pali. This collection, the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses, this is one of my favorite collections of the early suttas. I spend kind of most of my time like kind of digging through this volume in particular. And this volume, it's it groups these sutras together in terms of their theme. Their, that's why they're called the connected discourses, because they all have the same theme. 
And I want to read to you a little bit, and this is going to be actually from the section in the sutra or in the Nikaya, in the collection. This is the, the division on the skandhas. So we're going to read a couple of things about the skandhas, the aggregates as they're called. And I actually, I'm going to start, and this is, again, this is the sort of ease us into tonight. I want to start with a sutra from the Skandha Samyutta, from that section. This is uh, a little tiny sutta called The Burden. And there's not going to be there's not going to be a lotus flower reference here, but I kind of wanted to read this one first to kind of put us in the right mood, and then I'll read the next one. So I like this sutta. It's very, very small, but it, it uses this language of the burden, and in particular, laying down the burden. You hear about this a lot in the Buddhist tradition, especially the early Buddhist tradition, that you hear about various monks or nuns who, upon reaching like perhaps arhatship or these kind of higher achievements of early Buddhism, they describe them as having laid down the burden. And so... In division uh, 22, it's like division three, section 22, sutra number, uh, yeah, sutra, uh, it gets complicated in the Samyutta Nikaya, but it's called the burden. <clears throat> and at Shravasti, the Buddha said, bhikshus, monks, I will teach you the burden the carrier of the burden, the taking up of the burden, and the laying down of the burden. And what bhikshus is the burden? It should be said that the five aggregates which are subject to clinging, those are the burden. What five? The aggregate of form, rupa, subject to clinging. The aggregate of sensations, vedana, subject to clinging. The aggregate of perception, samnya, subject to clinging. The aggregate of conditioning or habits, samskara, subject to clinging and the aggregate of consciousness, vijnana, subject to clinging. This is called the burden. And what bhikshus is the carrier of the burden? It should be said that the person, this person, such and such a name of such and such a clan, this is called the carrier of the burden. And what bhikshus is taking up of the burden, it is this craving that leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust. Seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, craving for extermination. This is called taking up the burden. And what bhikshus is the laying down of the burden? It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that very same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance upon it. This is called laying down the burden. Okay, so that's, again, just a little, tiny little sutra. And that, of course, is the definition of the burden. The five aggregates of clinging, subject to clinging, fueled by craving, and laying down the burden is putting down the craving of the five aggregates which are subject to clinging. 
So, but now I want to read what I really wanted you to uh, kind of hear, but you kind of needed to have that fresh on your mind. The idea of laying down the burden. So this sutra, also in the skandha section, is a little tiny sutra. It's like basically a page called Flowers. So this is the Flowers Sutra. So also at Shravasti, the Buddha said bhikshus. <laughs> I do not dispute with the world. <laughs> Rather, it is the world that disputes with me. A proponent of the Dharma does not dispute with anyone in the world. Of that which the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, I too say that it does not exist. And of that which the wise of the world agree upon as existing, I too say that that exists. Ah, yeah, if you have this collection, I'm on page 949. Apologies for that. <clears throat> so the Buddha says, I don't dispute with the world. <laughs> the world disputes with me. I agree well, upon what everybody says is non-existent. I agree. And what everybody says exists. I agree. And what is it, bhikshus, that the wise in the world agree upon as not existing? Of which I too say that it does not exist? Form, rupa, that is permanent stable, eternal, not subject to change. This, the wise in the world agree upon as not existing. And I too say that it does not exist. Likewise, sensations that are permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change. Perception that is stable, permanent, eternal, not subject to change. States of conditioning, habits that are eternal, stable, not subject to change, and a consciousness that is eternal, stable, not subject to change. This, all of those, the wise in the world agree upon as not existing. And I too say that they do not exist. That bhikshus is what the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, and of which I too say that it does not exist. And what is it, bhikshus, that the wise in the world agree upon as existing, of which I too say that it exists? Form that is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as existing. And I too say that form that is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, I too say that exists. As well as sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness that is impermanent, that is suffering, and that is subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as existing, and I too say that all that exists. That bhikshus is what the wise in the world agree upon as existing, and that which I too say exists. Now there is bhikshus, a loka dharma, a worldly phenomena in the world, which the Buddha, the Tathagata, has awakened and broken through form, rupa, bhikshus, is a loka dharma, a world phenomena in the world to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. And having done so, he explains it, he teaches it, proclaims it, establishes, discloses it, analyzes it, and elucidates it. And when it is being thus explained and elucidated, elucidated by the Tathagata, if anyone does not know and see, how can I do anything with that foolish worldly, blind and sightless, who does not know and who does not see? Sensation, 
perception, conditioning, and consciousness are also worldly phenomena, loka dharma, in the world to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. Having done so, he explains it, teaches it, proclaims it, establishes it, discloses it, analyzes it, and elucidates it. When it's being thus explained and elucidated by the Tathagata, if anyone does not know and see, how can I do anything with that foolish worldling, blind and sightless, who does not know and who does not see? Bhikshus. Just like a blue lotus flower, or a red or a white lotus, just as they are born in the water and grow in the water, but having risen up above the water, it stands unsullied by the water. So too, the Tathagata was born in the world and grew up in the world, but having overcome the world, he dwells unsullied by the world. All right, so that's the Flowers Sutra. And to my knowledge, that's the first reference to the lotus flower in Buddhism. I have yet to find an earlier reference to the lotus flower. And that, by the way, is the, the classic number one way in which the lotus flower is used as a symbol in Buddhism. It's the symbolism of how a lotus flower begins its life in the mud, in the water, but then transcends the water and then blossoms. And that process of growing up in the mud, but transcending the mud, is sort of the working analogy for Buddhism, that that's what the whole kind of project is about, is this sort of transcending of the world. But the reason why I wanted to read the burden first is because I want you to kind of recognize that the world, the mud, the water that we are transcending is the mud of the five skandhas, that that's sort of the, the, the world, as it were, that we are born into. Yes, you can think of it as the world, like the, you know, the world with all of its problems and all of its strife and all of its suffering. But there's a way in which, based upon the contents of the Flowers Sutra, and also the fact that it is in the skandhas section, there's a, a way that we are to understand that when the Buddha says that he was born in the world, grew up in the world, but transcended it, he's referring to having been born in the body of the five skandhas and having grown up in the body of the five skandhas. But what makes a Buddha the Tathagata, the thus come one, is this idea of having awakened to and broken through the skandhas. And that being awakened to and breaking through is the transcending of the skandhas in that sense. And again, we have our reference to not just the lotus flower, but actually to the blue lotus flower, the white lotus flower, and the red lotus flower. So before I continue with kind of the Dharma talk about the lotus flower. Any questions about the burden or the flowers suttas? Cool. Yeah, so it's going to be a sutra packed night. We're going to be reading all kinds of different sutras. So the next up on kind of my agenda to discuss, and I, don't worry, we're not kind of done with those ideas. I just am kind of planting seeds in that way. So actually, the one thing I haven't mentioned, and this is for anybody who's new, I, I usually I say this a lot, and you know, it's one of those ideas that always winds its way into usually my Dharma talks. But if you don't know this, it's it's also very kind of 
helpful to know. The, the English word bud, B-U-D, like, like a flower bud, that word, and actually in English, it's important to remember that bud is a noun and a verb, like to bud is like for the little flower bud to pop out, to bud. And what is helpful to know is that that English word bud comes from the Sanskrit root bud, which is the root of buddha and buddhi, awakening or an awakened one. And so what I'm getting at is, is that when we talk about a buddha, the reference is the budding of a flower. In other words, you can also talk about the budding of a flower as the awakening of the flower, like the opening up and the awakening of the flower. Well, what we want to know, or I don't actually want to put it like that, I want you to know that the way that I think about Buddhism and the Dharma is that it is all about, and, and we know this, that the, it is all about bodhi, which again, the root word of bodhi, B-O-D-H-I, is that same root word bud. And so for me, Buddhism, and now we can actually start to think of Buddhism as like bud, budism, right? Which is a beautiful idea that that's what this tradition or this religion is all about, budding, right? So the idea is, is that we, in the Buddhist tradition, they describe like the goal, for lack of a better term, they describe it as budding, as awakening. And that awakening is that lotus flower coming out of the water and then budding, awakening. But the idea is, is that there's, it's indicative or representative of this experience of awakening. And as many of you know, I kind of always, I use dreams as like analogies a lot. When I'm trying to describe a lot of different Buddhist ideas, I'm always sort of referring, well, it's like in a dream, right? And the idea is, is that when I'm using the dream analogy, I am usually referring to a dream in which we don't know it's a dream. And then I'm using that as kind of a, to to stand for ignorance, a state of not knowing what's going on. It, a great example of that is being in a dream, but not knowing that. And so you're behaving in an entirely, like you're behaving a certain way in the dream because you think it's reality. But what we could have is a lucid dream. And a lucid dream, if you've had one, is a really special experience because you wake up, but you're still in the dream, but you're awake. And the important thing about that is noticing that when one has a lucid dream, the dream is exactly like it was a second ago. What is different is the way that you are relating to the dream. When I'm ignorant of the dream state, I'm running around, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do stuff, I'm trying to get somewhere. As soon as I become lucid, I'm no longer afraid of the stuff in the dream because I know I'm dreaming. I know that I'll wake up. So the, my fear subsides. To a certain degree, my desire subsides because I realize all of this is dream and I can't really do anything with this. 
So my whole disposition changes because of this lucid dream experience of awakening within a dream. Well, the way that I teach Buddhism is that I believe that they are describing methods and techniques for waking up here and having a lucid life experience. For me, that's what bodhi is, a lucid life in which your disposition towards all of this changes radically. But nothing changes. It still looks like this. But the way you feel about it all changes. So that's how I think of bud, budding and awakening. So, Noam, thanks for waiting. You have a question? Yeah, no, thanks for that. That was great. Um, I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly because I was. it occurred to me uh, after the second sutra that that it, it's it's almost I think you were saying that we as the lotus is growing up through the mud and the water it's because of the five skandhas that it can do that and then when it buds when it awakens it's awakening to the five skandhas which is sort of to, to the fact that the five skandhas are there. And then I want to connect that to the, was the first sutra saying the skandhas aren't a problem. It's the, it's the clinging to them. That's the problem. Right. So the, it's, you know, how we talk a lot about, Oh, you know, we have this unique human birth that gives us the possibility of awakening, uh, you know, animals can't awaken and, and neither can devas. Right. And that's because they don't have the same five skandhas we have. Like it's, because like five skandhas do are what enables awakening or allows it or something. Does that make sense? Is that totally. right? Yep. And I, yep. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Noam, because there was a way in which after I read those two sutras, I, I knew, I knew I hadn't fully explained that. So I'm, thank you for <laughs> reminding me. So what, yeah, what does that mean to put down the burden? Right. And what does it mean to suggest that the five skandhas are the world and that a Buddha transcends the world and then awakens like the lotus flower. Obviously, as usual, this is just how I understand the Dharma, how I experience and practice it in that way. But my general understanding of even, you know, I'm going to stick with the Hinayana stuff, the early Buddha stuff, because the sutras come from that tradition. And the basic idea, Noam, as I understand it, is that there is a mode of being that identifies with and as the physical body, which is to say, as the skandhas. And that's where we get into saying, like, yeah, this is me, this is me, this is me. And that identification with the skandhas is of course problematic because the skandhas are constantly changing and so the the, the mind the mind though that is identifying with the skandhas the mind in that sense it doesn't fully cognize that the skandhas are constantly changing. And so there's a way in which by over-identifying with the skandhas, there's a, a kind of friction, a kind of disjuncture between, ident like we identify as the body, but the body keeps changing. So it's confusing for that mind that identifies with the skandhas. But that is the situation in which we are born. We are born into this body of five skandhas. We grow up in these five skandhas. But what it would mean to transcend them and then be that lotus that awakens is to no longer foolishly identify with 
the body as if it weren't changing when it is changing a state of consciousness as if it weren't changing when it is constantly changing so in other words and this is where it gets very tricky dharmically speaking the teaching the dharma is so tricky when it comes to this and it has to do with if there's the skandhas and I keep talking about a state of mind that is identifying with the skandhas. If, if I talk about not doing that, if I talk about not identifying with or as the five skandhas, then we want to know about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm with you. So then what is that? Like that is no longer identifying with the skandhas or that used to be identifying with the skandhas. Isn't that the self? Isn't that? Mm -hmm. And this is where it, it gets very tricky, as I was saying, because you will often hear a kind of way of talking about that mind, the mind that we would be curious about, like what that is. There's a way that they talk about that as being not the skandhas, but not other than the skandhas either. And that brings us around, Noam, to your first or part of your question, which was about in the, I forget if it was the first or the second one, but where it identified the craving as actually what is being put down. Again, I forget which version of which the first or second sutra, but what we're getting at is, is this, we're getting at a sort of a way in which the, the body of the skandhas, especially in the Hinayana, the body of the skandhas is the evolutionary biological body, which has all of this kind of uh well samskara conditioning built into it but i'm talking about the deep evolutionary conditioning like uh the the drive to reproduce the drive to eat the drive to uh do a lot of things so there's a way in which this these five what are they the five skandhas subject to clinging the skandhas are in the business of clinging it's just like what they do. And so when the mind is identifying with or as the skandhas, there's a way in which that mind then is sort of then just along for the ride of the clinging and the craving aspects of the skandhas. And what they're talking about or what the Dharma is about in some respects is a kind of distancing from those skandhas so that the mind is not it's like the, the classic example is the uh the 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 horses and the chariot and the idea is is that the body or the skandhas like the five skandhas in that sense are kind of like the horses and for most of us the horses, which are the craving, the senses, the desires. For many of us, the horses are driving the, the whole show. And we, the mind, is sort of just up in the helm, like along for the ride. But the, sen the senses and the skandhas are driving this. What they talk about, though, is through the cultivation practices, through meditation, through mind training, we basically can, in a way, mm, this gets tricky because it depends on which school of early Buddhism you're talking about, but there's a way in which we can basically get a hold of those horses. And it's no longer that, like, it's no longer that what is on the mind is just what the horses brought me to go see. There's a more agency in that sense. You know, I often get this 
uh, question about free will and determinism in Buddhism. Like, so does Buddhism believe in free will or does Buddhism believe in determinism? Like that we're just totally subject to our conditioning. And the answer is basically yes. <laughs> Buddhism completely believes that we are totally conditioned and that there's like no free will, except there is free will. But it's not what you might think it is. And what I mean by that is, is that the freedom is not being attached to the skandhas in that way. Insofar as you identify with the physical body, insofar as you are identifying with or as the skandhas, no free will. Pure conditioning. Even every thought that you have actually has just bubbled up because of conditioning. That even our own thinking is not autonomous, is not in, in that sense free. It's conditioned. But that's when, if, when we are identifying with and as the skandhas. If you don't do that, you get closer to our hotship or to thagatahood or whatever. And Buddhas are entirely free versus worldlings, as they would be called, which are those of us that are attached to the skandhas. We are not free at all even though we presume a sense of freedom in terms of thought or speech. So, no, did that answer anything? Okay, good. Any other questions, comments, answers, ideas about the first the skandhas, first sutras? Yeah, Maria. Hmm? Oh, no, okay, could you? There we go. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, uh, it seems like um, maybe just tell me if this is an apt uh, um, simile. Like, so if the unawakened mind is the mind in the chariot being driven by the horses, once you've awakened, it's more like um, the five skandhas are sort of in orbit around the mind and sort of not in control anymore of an awakened mind or um, an enlightened mind, hopefully, um, at some point. But would you say maybe that's an, more of an intermediate stage and sort of Buddhahood is even beyond the skandhas being sort of in orbit around? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, of course, I have no idea what it means to be fully awakened. <laughs> Uh, any, you know, any answers are coming from a, like a very scholastic uh, academic sense in that way, in terms of what I've heard or read about full awakening. Although I will tell you from personal experience, in terms of like my, my personal development from 20, 30 years ago, when I started to now, again, not fully awakened, but maybe better off in that sense. A way to think about what I'm describing, about our relationship to the skandhas, one really, like, it's, I find this to be a very direct way to understand it. It actually has a lot to do with, oh, it has to do with uh, tonight's other theme, which is Buddhist medicine. So what I'm thinking of is it's about, um, it could be about uh, illness, but I'm kind of just want to create a, an easy example. But what I'm thinking of is something, something coming up with the body, right? And it could be something like, um, you know, a backache, or it could be something, you know, any number of problems that would happen with the body. Okay. And the difference that I'm talking about between identifying with or as the skandhas versus not doing that. There's one mode of being in which when something goes wrong with the body in that way, because of over-identifying with the body, 
there is this kind of immediate sense of like, why me? Like, why is this happening to me? And what I, and this is kind of like first arrow, second arrow stuff that I talked about last week. But my point is, is that there is a way to relate to the illnesses of the body in which it's very personal. And so there's that extra level of psychological suffering that is heaped on top of the original phenomena of a backache or what have you. And I choose the, the backache as an example because, you know, for many of us, there's so much wrapped up in like aging, feelings of helplessness and decrepit, like decrepitude and our backs. Like so many back problems are psychological and not physical, but because we hold a lot of uh, psychological things, especially again, as far as aging, feeling capable or not. So my point is, is that you can imagine getting a backache and then immediately being like, oh my God, it's over. I'm good. It's like, my life's over. And so again, the psychological uh, drama that's heaped on top of it because of, because I have a backache or like my back is aching versus a mode in which the mind is cognizant that there is a sensation going on there, but can actually observe that phenomena without identifying with it. And I don't know if you've ever done this. A lot of people I've noticed have done this. A really simple exercise in this is if you ever stub your toe. When you stub your toe, it can be the most excruciating, painful thing. However, if you do a little kind of meditation and you really just kind of zone in on what you are perceiving of as pain, you can, in the right meditative state of mind, notice it as a just a physical sensation. And you will start noticing that, yeah, it has qualities of heat, it has qualities of tingliness, but you'll begin to notice that it doesn't exactly hurt. It's a phenomena, it's happening, but it actually doesn't hurt as much. And that's when we have that, that distance versus when we over-identify with it. And then the agony begins in that sense. So I hope that kind of clarifies it a little bit, like that difference, Maria. Yes, I and I have done this with menstrual cramps. <laughs> uh, I've totally done this. And I started doing it when I was a teenager and I didn't know anything about any of this. And I totally was like, if I can, it takes really deep concentration, but if I can just feel it as a sensation, the pain is not there. It's just not, I'm not subject to it. It's just a sensation that I'm disconnected from. So yes, I totally can identify with that. Nice. Yeah. And that's the idea. Now, what we really want to then notice, Maria, is that the physical aspects that we're describing that's one thing but now get up to the more subtle aspects which is something like so you know let's say somebody uh whatever somebody on the street says something i don't know about my nose i don't know but they say something critical about my nose and all of a sudden i am upset i'm angry because they've said this thing about my nose. But if I could have that same sort of relationship where I'm not identifying as the nose, but I recognize that there is a nose on this face, if I can have that kind of distance, then when this person says this thing, 
I might actually be able to be like compassionate for that person who clearly has some issues where they want to go around making fun of people's noses. But me, I don't have like, it's not affecting me, but it could affect me if I were over identified with the nose and then felt personally injured. So this has layers to it, Maria, is what I'm getting at. Like there's the physical stuff that we can distance, but then there's also the other deeper stuff. And you can imagine that keeps going, keeps going until Buddhahood, when there is total, there's nothing to get upset about anymore in that way. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and uh, these are great questions too, because they allow me like, that opportunity to mention again that I'm not enlightened at all, but I am a practitioner and I've had a lot of change in my life personally, where I've gone like from A, I always say, I feel like I've gone from A to B to C to D and even like E and it's, <laughs> they're right. And they're talking about going all the way to Z. <laughs> And now that I've made it from A to B, C, D, E, I believe, I believe in Z, even though I haven't experienced Z. I've experienced step A, B, C, D, and E, and it's all been right. My, the suffering has been alleviated, all of these things. So I'm like ready to keep going in that way. So just want to make, I always like that chance to make clear that I'm, I'm practicing like all the rest of us, of course. All right. So great, great Dharma doors so far. Great conversation. Um, let's get to the other sutra, the Upaya Sutra, so we can at least talk about what, what prompted tonight's talk. So we're back in the treasury of Mahayana sutras. We're back at the last sutra, the Upaya Sutra. I'm jumping to, yeah. So I'm over on page 458, if you have this book. And so, if you remember, the sutra is exploring um, different kind of controversial moments in the life of the Buddha, and then asking these questions about why those things happened, right? So like last week, the Buddha was pricked by a Kadira thorn. And the question was, why did the Buddha get pricked by the Kadira thorn? And it turns out it was, you know, a comeuppance for past karma. And even a Buddha is not, you know, free of that. But although last week we explored that same idea that, yeah, you might still get pricked, but depending on your reaction to being pricked by the thorn, that's really what determines the suffering. So another question arises about something that the Buddha did that seems questionable. Like, why did that happen? So the question is, why did the Buddha once ask the doctor called life-giving, why did the Buddha ask the doctor for a blue lotus flower, sniff it, and then swallow it, though he was not ill? Well, listen closely. Not long after the Tathagata composed the precepts for liberation, there were 500 monks who had come to their very last existence in Sansara and who had often cultivated the path in secluded forests. These monks were afflicted with a disease which could not be cured with the stale medicine that they had but they did not seek or take other medicine because they kept the Buddha's precepts with respect and care. Now, at that time, the Tathagata, the Buddha thought, what upaya, what skillful means should I devise in order to give them permission to take other medicine? Now, if the Tathagata gave them permission, those monks would seek and take some other medicine which could cure them. But if the Tathagata does not give them permission, future monks 
would break the noble law when they would take good medicine. Hence the Tathagata as an upaya asked the doctor, life-giving, for a blue lotus flower. He smelled it or sniffed it and then swallowed it. Then a god of the pure abodes of heaven went to the monks that were sick and said, virtuous ones, you can seek other medicine. Don't die of this sickness. Those monks said, we dare not disobey the instructions of the world honored one. If we disobey his instructions, we'll feel terrible. <laughs> We'd rather die than disobey the instructions of the Buddha. We will not seek a life-prolonging good medicine. After they had said so, that God said, virtuous ones, the Tathagata, the Dharma, the Dharma Raja, the king of the Dharma, he has himself sought out a good medicine, rejecting stale ones, virtuous ones. You may seek another medicine which can cure you. Having heard these words, the monks no longer hesitated to seek and take the good medicine, and thus they were healed of their disease. Less than seven days after they had recovered from their illness, they, they realized our hotship. Now, if the Tathagata had not taken other medicine, the monks would not have done so either. If they had not taken the other medicine, it would have been, it would have been impossible for them to reach, to rid themselves of the disease, sever their defilements, and realize our hardship. And this was all an upaya of the Tathagata. Okay, so there's actually a lot of interesting ideas in there that I want to explore. Um, so the first one is I want to let you know about what the rule was, like what swept with the rule, and then what's with this amendment to the rules. So one of the things that you should know is that in the earliest version of Buddhism, what is called Hinayana in that way, there is what is known as the Vinaya, or sometimes pronounced the Vinaya, which is the list of all the 250 or so rules, the precepts, for the fully ordained monastics. Of those 250 some odd rules, a few of them are about medicine. And in the Vinaya, there are only five medicines that, uh, that monastics are permitted to take. Uh, ghee, purified butter, uh, regular butter, uh, oil, I'm not, I, I've never found a specific kind of oil, but oil, honey, and sugar. Those are the five medicines that are, they are kind of, they're not prohibited, but they are understood to be medicine. And they're the only medicines that the Buddhists in the original tradition would allow. And things like honey, by the way, was has always been a very traditional uh, honey or medicine in that way. So this is not abnormal, like these five uh, substances, pretty normal kind of, you know, ancient medicine in that way. But that is what the text is referring to as far as like what the monks had, because it said they had medicine, but it had gone stale. And the stale clearly was either the sugar, the oil, or the honey, or what have you. So in this, we have this situation where the monks are going to basically, you know, continue to be ill. And as it says at the end, they'll eventually die and they won't even get to realize our hardship. But they're going to be good monks and they're going to stick to the rules. And so they're not going to seek better medicine. And so that's where the Buddha has this situation where he's like, well, I want to, I want them to be able to heal themselves. And so I better do this. 
in order to set the precedent that says it's okay to eat the blue lotus flower. So there's a few different things going on here. And one of them, that's sort of the main idea, it's this idea about, about changing the rules. Now, a famous story comes out of the uh, Parinirvana Sutra. So the last sutra that the Buddha gave, like on his deathbed. And it was in or during that sutra that Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin, is asking the, the Buddha a bunch of questions. And it's a bunch of things, actually, that are, are about um, revisions. And what I mean is, is that during the lifetime of the Buddha, all of the uh, monastics would all refer to each other as friend, regardless of who or what, you know, everybody was friend. But on his deathbed, in this sutra, Ananda asks about what should, like, how should we address each other? Like, should we keep calling each other friends? And the Buddha says this thing about, how no, actually, the younger monks can refer to each other as friends, but younger monks should refer to older monks as venerable. So that's like one change that the Buddha gives, where he's like, yeah, yeah, I know we used to just do the friend thing, but now we're going to have like some respect for their, uh, the older monks. So that becomes the new rule. It's during this Mahaparinirvana Sutra that the Buddha also tells Ananda that it's okay to change the minor rules. And then the Buddha dies. And then famously, everybody is upset at Ananda because he didn't ask the Buddha what the minor rules were. <laughs> and then this just opens up this huge kind of chasm within the world of Buddhism in terms of what did the Buddha mean by the minor rules? And so there are actually, after the Buddha dies, there are schisms that happen in the Hinayana, like in the early form of Buddhism, and they schism, they break into different sects because one of the groups changes what it considers to be the minor rules, and another group of monks are like, that's not a minor rule, that's a major rule. And so they split because this group thinks that they're in accordance with the words of the Buddha. And this group thinks they're in accordance with the words of the Buddha. And so that's where they sort of part ways in that sense. So there's always sort of been this, this uh, question in the world of Buddhism about the malleability, if you will, of the, of the discipline. This little uh, this little section here that I read is about that same idea. And there's a way in which you can read this. And even when I was reading it just now, I sort of noticed even more layers. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, you can read this as literally that it's about stale honey or stale oil or stale medicine. and the Buddha gave these 500 monks permission to get better medicine. So you can read it at that kind of um, like a literal level in terms of what it says. But where it gets really interesting is if you remember or if you know that within the world of Buddhism, the Dharma is often referred to as the medicine for this illness called life. And so you can actually read that story at a kind of slightly more meta level where it's kind of actually about the stale teachings of the Hinayana and this idea that there might be better medicine in the Mahayana. And so these monks are saved and achieve our hardship with the new better medicine. 
you could read it that way. And because this is like the Upaya Sutra that we're reading, because it is so like Mahayana extra where they're trying to rewrite all of the Buddhist history, but in the Mahayana way, I think that that's a possible reading of that, of that story. So yeah, Noe. Hi. Noam, can you unmute Noe or can I? I probably can. Oh, hey there. Oh, there Great. You are. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm reminded of the monks who were being bothered by the little bugs, the little spirits in the, the woods. Yakshas. The yakshas. And in order to help them, he pulled something out, uh, a, a reading. And we're not sure if it was something that he inherited from previous studies. Oh, yeah. You remember this? Is this really in reference, feeling like in reference to that, that he gave him a different medicine, a different way of being in, in relationship to the world? Rather than complaining about the bugs, let's offer uh, merit. Uh, uh, yes, something like this. Do you recall? <laughs> I do. Excellent. Good Excellent. memory. Great memory, Noe. Yeah, that's the story of the kind of the the origin of the uh, loving kindness, uh, the metta meditation. So in that story that Noe's referencing, all of the monks were in the forest one day, and there was all these yakshas, these like tree spirits that were being very loud upstairs. And the monks down there couldn't meditate. So they went to the Buddha and basically were like, Buddha, can you perform some magic and make these yakshas go away? And he said, actually, I'll do, I'll do one better. <laughs> Rather than making them go away, he said, and he taught them this loving kindness meditation. And you've probably done it because it's a very kind of common Buddhist meditation in terms of extending loving kindness the Buddha says, first generate a sphere of loving kindness and bring all of the sangha, all of your brethren that are trying to meditate, bring them into the sphere of loving kindness, and then envelop the yakshas in that sphere of loving kindness, and then do this with compassion, and then do this with mudita, joy, and then do it with equanimity. And by the time you go through this four step process, the yakshas are up there, yip, 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 and the monks are down there just peacefully meditating, not disturbed by the yakshas anymore. Great, great uh, tying together, Noe, of like that, which was truly an upaya in that way, truly an upaya here. Yeah. All right. So, a couple more things. I haven't told you about the Utpala. So Utpala is the Sanskrit word for the blue lotus. So U-T-P-A-L-A, -A, Utpala. There is also the uh, Pundarika, which is the red lotus, or sorry, the white lotus flower is the Pundarika. And the Padma, you might have heard of the Padma flower, but a Padma is a red lotus flower. So Buddhism makes a distinction between these flowers and eventually a little bit more in the Mahayana tradition, the red lotus flower, the Padma becomes kind of symbolic of compassion. Whereas the white lotus flower is sort of indicative of all things pure, pretty standard kind of idea of the white lotus flower. And then there's this blue lotus flower. And the blue lotus flower is a rather mysterious flower. It's, it's um, well, one of the things that I wanted to mention to you that I will, it kind of makes this, uh, it makes this story a little more interesting. So the blue lotus flower, if you didn't know, has a very long history, in particular, it has a long history in Egypt. So the ancient Egyptians for going back a long time, 
are famous for having made a psychedelic tincture out of the petals of the blue lotus flower. So mm -hmm. the Egyptians would take the, uh, and I forget the, the technical name for the blue lotus flower. Um, I don't have it anywhere. I, I could look it up, but this particular species of lotus flower, the blue lotus flower, its petals contain some kind of interesting alkaloid that the Egyptians would steep the petals in a tea and then add alcohol and distill that into a tincture. What they did with the tincture, I haven't been able to find. I don't know if they ingested it or if they put it in their eyeballs. Like there's a lot of ways to ingest psychedelics as we know. But the point is, is that this flower is considered this like, you know, mystical, psychedelic kind of flower. And if you read, if you read this version of the Upaya Sutra that's uh, translated from Tibetan, in this version of the sutra, they are more explicit about that the, the, the Buddha, um, it, it didn't, it, it, at least according to the, the Tibetan version, the Buddha didn't smell the blue lotus flower. The Buddha snorted the blue lotus flower, according to that one, which makes it even more interesting. Now, it, it would make sense that he would either snort it or he would ingest it because he was taking it seemingly for medicinal purposes. And those are two different ways to get things into your blood system. So, but my point is, is that you could also read that little moment where the Buddha allows the monastics to take the blue lotus flower. If you were so inclined, you could take that in a different direction. I'm not suggesting you take it in that direction, but I'm just saying one could in that way. All right. Uh, yeah, I have time. So yeah, oh yeah, and the, the blue lotus also, the Utpala flower, as far as I've been able to do research on the more traditional Indian uses of it, not the Egyptian psychedelic uses, but the in, the in India, it was used seemingly more as a, like a diuretic, I suppose. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Um, yeah, actually... Let me, let me do this because if I don't start this, I might not get to it. So I want to round out. I want to kind of finish this talk about the lotus flower and in particular, the blue lotus flower by kind of bringing this all the way to the more kind of more advanced forms of Buddhism. I'm thinking about the Vajrayana, the sort of more you know, tantric form of Buddhism and what I want to kind of finish with is, and I wish I had better pictures. I, I have to get better um, art books to show everybody. Um, but this is a really good book, by the way. It's called Meeting the Buddhas. It's by this person here, uh, Vesantara. And uh, it's a really great guidebook to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It's one of the better ones I've come across where it's kind of has everybody and it gives everybody a good treatment in that way. And I want to share with you this person. So you might have seen this person before. This is a, well, it depends on who you talk to. It's either a bodhisattva or a Buddha named Tara. And Tara is often sometimes with a green body. This is the green Tara. And this is the white Tara. And the white Tara is famous because she carries the blue lotus flower. In fact, she is Tara, this, this Buddha Bodhisattva, is called like the Utpala bearer. Like that's the association is with uh, this Tara. So if you don't know about Tara, so... Tara is sort of a, a pretty late addition to the Buddhist pantheon. It, she and Tara is unequivocally female. There is 
not, you know, a lot of bodhisattvas can be depicted male or female, and it speaks to their kind of androgynous mode or their androgynousness, androgyny. But Tara is female through and through. And the interesting thing about Tara, so as always, I like to start with the etymology in that way. What's really interesting about the name Tara. So Tara is, so Tara seems to originally have been a particular kind of goddess, if you will, a goddess figure, particularly for mariners, for fishermen, for sailors. And the point is, is that sailors would use the sky and the stars to navigate. And in particular, of course, they would use, you know, conjunction of the North Star to kind of, uh, to understand where they were. It was a direction finder. Well, Tara, that word Tara is where we get the English word star from. <laughs> star comes from Sanskrit. The root of it is this tar, which is the root of Tara. And so Tara is this star goddess sort of originally associated with the North Star. And so, but then you can, you can go really deep with the Tara because Oh, there's I can't I can't get into it, but there's just a lot of relationship. If you've heard of Ishtar, which is this sort of Persian deity associated with Easter, that's Ishtar is Tar, the same Tara. There's a lot of relationships there. So this is another one of those Buddhist uh, deities, for lack of a better term, that sort of has a lot of different versions. Now within the world of Buddhism. Tara is very, very associated with Avilokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And the story is, and this is just the story. So Avilokiteshvara, or Guanyin, or Canon, like this, the, the Bodhisattva of compassion. The name Avilokiteshvara can be interpreted or translated as the hearer of the world. And in particular, what that references is, is that there is a particular siddhi, a particular supernatural ability that meditators, yogis, bodhisattvas, buddhas develop. And it's called the divine ear. And the divine ear is like the divine eye, except for the div divine eye can see vast distances, can see other dimensions or other spiritual planes of existence. The divine ear can hear, uh, in, in English, we would call it clairaudience versus clairvoyance, clear seeing versus clear hearing. So clairaudience, the hearing ghosts, being able to communicate with the spirit world, all of that is the divine ear. But the story is, is that when Avilokiteshvara was cultivating and cultivating and then first developed the divine ear, it said that all Avilokiteshvara could hear was the world's sorrow all the people crying, all the people sobbing, just all of the suffering is what Avilokiteshvara heard. And that's what put that bodhisattva on this sort of mission to alleviate all suffering. It's from this ability to hear the world's crying. Part of that story is that upon hearing the world's crying, Avilokiteshvara shed 
21 tiers. And everywhere that those tiers dropped, a lotus flower sprung out of the ground with a Tara seated on it. And there were originally, the idea was that there were 21 different colored Taras. And these then, the like Tara then represents Avilokiteshvara's compassion for humanity in that way. And of the various 21 colors of, of Tara, two sort of rose like to the top, the green Tara and the white Tara. And they both sort of have different things going on with them as far as green and green bodied beings in Buddhism are usually medicinal or healing related to that kind of energy. Whereas white bodied beings tend to be more about the spiritual achievements and spiritual accomplishments and things like that. So Tara becomes this sort of um, well, basically, frankly, she does become a kind of savior goddess in that way. So she becomes an object of devotion, like in times of need, again, whether they be sort of medical times of need or spiritual times of need or what have you. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about Tara, and I'll grab a book real quick. So this, of course, is the book, The Cult of Tara, Magic and Ritual in Tibet. It's a pretty big book. I wouldn't necessarily recommend you getting this unless you're like really into Tara. Then this is the study of Tara. So this is a great book. But I would also actually then suggest you thinking about this book about Guanyin by... Uh, Chun Fang Yu, who teaches at Columbia, I don't know if you both see that, Chung Fang Yu, she's a professor at, or at least she used to be at Columbia, I don't know if she is anymore. So she wrote the definitive study of Avilokiteshvara, but with a focus on her Chinese kind of incarnation. And what she suggests, which is very interesting, is that Tara the female bodhisattva also again in some in some schools she's considered a buddha not just a bodhisattva but tara is from india like i already mentioned she was kind of part of the indian buddhist culture indian buddhist tradition avilokiteshvara was originally of course from india from the indian buddhist tradition what seems to have happened according to chunfang yu is that because of the close association between Tara and Avilokiteshvara, when images of Tara made their way to China, they were mistaken for Avilokiteshvara. And so that's why the Chinese version of Avilokiteshvara, which is Guanyin or Guanshiyin, looks a lot more feminine and a lot more like Tara. And her theory or thesis of that book is that, oh, it's because they mistook Tara for Avilokiteshvara because they have this really close relationship. So just wanted you to know that, that kind of that family of bodhisattvas in that way. And Avilokiteshvara, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it on here. Let's see. But Avilokiteshvara, if you can see it, let's see, it's here. But this is a lotus flower. It's on a long stem. And Avilokiteshvara used to be called, like in the earliest forms of Buddhist art and iconography, Avilokiteshvara was called. Padmapani, the lotus bearer. And that, the, that is sort of then the, this link between the iconography of Avilokiteshvara and the iconography of Tara is that they are both these lotus bearers, the lotus flower holders in that way. 
And based upon everything I've said tonight, kind of going all the way back to the beginning, in terms of like my opening remarks about the lotus flower as representing like Buddhism, like representing the, like what it's all about which is about awakening and budding and in particular, the lotus flower growing out of the mud, like all of that, like Buddhism becomes symbolized by the lotus flower. And so then when you go, if you know that and you go back and you look at imagery of either Avilokiteshvara as the lotus bearer, or even Tara as the lotus bearer. I want you to think about now that they, in a way, are holding and offering the Dharma. They are holding and offering Buddhism. Like when you see one of these bodhisattvas holding a lotus flower, like you can think of that lotus flower as just symbolizing the entire message of the Dharma in that way. So. And because I, I'll forget one more time if I don't mention this. So interestingly enough, and I, I'm sure all of you will actually really, really get a kick out of this. So uh, earlier today, I was you know preparing for tonight and I was get, finding my little notes, trying to find pictures of Tara and things like that. And the last little piece of information that I found out about Tara, just maybe a couple hours ago, Tara is called or considered the protector of the Kadira forest. The Kadira was the theme of last week, the Kadira thorn, which came from this uh, Akasha tree or acacia yeah. tree, sorry. And so interesting that Tara, the blue lotus holder, would be also known as the protector of the Kadira forest. So that was just too uh, uh, fortuitous, uh, that little bit. So I definitely wanted to share that with you, with you all. Any thoughts about any of that? Questions or ideas? Yeah, Noe. Um. The final, the final pose, the Buddha in front of the congregation and holding up a lotus flower, and turning it. <laughs> Excellent. Upaya, <laughs> and that is what that is all about. Excellent. All right. If that's uh, if everybody, I'm going to kind of call it a night. Uh, that was a lot of lotus lotus information. So. Thank you all so much. So great to see you all. Ah. Thank you.